Um, yeah, so we're going to have uh, four talks this afternoon, two by Lena Rubenstein Dunlop and two by Raphael Houston. Um, and uh, Colleen has been at the University of Queensland since uh, 1989, I think. I was already here at that stage. Uh, she's originally from uh, Poland, but did her uh, doctorate in uh, Sweden. Grew when, up there too. Pardon? Grew up there too, the same oh, okay, there. Right. And uh, started off as a spectroscopist, well, she still is a spectroscopist. But uh, when she came to the University of Queensland, she started up some work on optical tweezers. And uh, uh, she's going to be talking about some of the relevance of that uh, this afternoon. Um, and, uh, well, Thank you. off you go. Okay, is that on? Yes, I suppose it is on. Okay, well, thank you very much for staying with us here for that long call. What I'm going to talk about is sort of continue from where Kishan left. Uh, optical pieces um, yesterday, talking about transfer of linear momentum of light, and he left the uh, angular momentum to be, and then he'll be coming back and talking about a lot of other exciting things, it is tomorrow, is it? on Thursday. Now, what I want to concentrate on is to talk about transfer of angular momentum of light, uh, and um, see where it uh, can take us. So basically, we have seen already the, the transfer of linear momentum of light and looking at laser tweezers when we were moving things in x, y, z direction. And then I think that Kishan is going to mention laser scissors, aren't you? So, oh, the thing disappeared. Anyway, never mind. Um, so uh, laser scissors is a very exciting area as well and has been around for a very long time and enables us to uh, do a lot of uh, biological applications and very exciting research. But I will touch upon that today. I leave it to uh, Keisha. There is also work has been done on using uh, the same sort of technology as laser catapult. I won't touch upon that if you want to know about it, ask me in the break. And uh, what I want to concentrate on is other tools, screwdriver, Spanner, which uh, Kishan already mentioned. So remember he was telling us that when you have a puncture and you want to see how much pressure you got on your, in your tires, you might want a device like that one at the very end there. And what that device is, is that it's actually measuring how much torque you are applying. So that's what we want to be able to do. So these are the three things which I'll be concentrating on and their applications. Okay, so the outline, outline of my talk is uh, transfer of linear momentum first, just have a tiny little look at that, and then optical tweezers transfer of angular momentum of light, rotation of trapped particles, I want to use it for microbiology, and then I also want to measure the optical torque, so I want to use two types of angular momentum of light, spin angular momentum and orbital angular momentum. And then I want to look at the things which can give me the rotation. And then, once we learn what sort of things will be uh, possible to rotate, then we want to get a little bit more control over it all. So we want to produce micro machines and look at the design and then see at the, uh, look at the use of them. And at the back here sits our Theodor Asabai, who is a specialist in producing those micro machines. And on Friday, we'll take you around our labs and show you a few little applications of optical tweezers, cold atoms, and other things. Okay, so we already heard from Kishan that uh, if you have a, uh, if you, if you have, um, a light beam with H uh, bar K of um, uh, coming onto the, onto the uh, some little entity, will exert force on it, which will be 2H by, uh, 2H bar K. And so what it gives us is the manipulation in three dimensions, basically, of the little particle which is trapped in very highly focused laser beam. Uh, and uh, what can it do? As you saw from Kishan's talk, it's very simple. And in the combination with measurement and theory, we can, do, we can get very powerful tool. And typical, uh, typically we have um, uh, if, 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 if I have one micron beam ray 
dangerous particle, our exact force of about one picojoule per milliwatt. And you also remember that Kishan did say that also pico, although picojoule doesn't sound like a big force, for what we want to do, it's plenty enough. Okay, but really what we want to do is to look at angular momentum of light, and I can have it comes in two sorts spin angular momentum, so I have my electromagnetic field vector here, and you can see that it's rotating, and each photon in, in, in this beam will carry plus minus h bar per photon for, for a photon of angular, of angular momentum. So we can have right-handed or left-handed circularly polarized light, we say. We can also have orbital angular momentum, and Kishan did say that I will show you how to produce beams which carry orbital angular momentum, and I will do it shortly. So this is a nice example of orbital angular momentum beam, and actually Raphael showed you the lowest order of such beam that Gabon Felix was showing you yesterday, and then Kishan asking why don't you use higher order beams? Well, I will be using slightly higher. Okay, so, so this is orbital angular momentum, uh, beam carry orbital angular momentum, and we have plus minus a L h bar per photon of orbital angular momentum, where L is a, um, um, a, um, a number which I can vary quite substantially. So we will be looking at that. Oh, okay, so we were talking, Kishan was talking about optical forces exerted by linear momentum in the trap, so I just summarize it here. So basically, if I now move my entity, the little bacterium or a molecular motor or particle around, uh, I can look at the motility, for example, of molecular motor uh, by applying optical force to it. And then I can calculate it and give quantitative analysis of the force, and Kishan told you how to do that. So this is the simplest setup of optical tweezers, which also have been shown before. So we need um, a laser beam, doesn't have to be particularly strong, and I need a high numerical aperture objective, and then I uh, focus the beam to tiny this little spot, diffraction limited spot, and then I have my whatever it is I want to manipulate. And um, then we can introduce a few other elements into the beam. I wanted to have beam which is either linearly polarized or circularly polarized, and you know from your second year optics or first or third, wherever you learn optics, that if I have a lambda of a quarter length wave plate, I, if I have light coming at a certain angle to this lambda of a four plate, I can create circularly polarized light, either left-handed or right-handed circularly polarized light. Or I can have lambda of a two plate so just to maintain the linearly polarized light, but by changing the plate, the, 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 the axis of the of the lambda over two plate, I can change the direction of the linearly polarized light. But I can also use other things, and I'll be talking more in more details about it. I can use holographic, holographically produced uh, um, 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 things, which will enable me, which look a little bit like that, and which will enable me to produce those beams which carry orbital angular momentum. And then I can look either in a view the whole situation either in reflected light, which was also mentioned by both Kishan and by Lenz, or we can look at the transmitted light. And in many of the experiments that I'll be talking about, I would want to collect all the light which is transmitting, transmitted through the sample. Okay? So again, in order to create these special beams, I, I use a holographic plate. We also, at the end of it, will show Kishan that we are starting to use SLMs because we have some results of SLMs. So the story goes that all the groups around the world were using SLMs to produce the uh, orbital angular momentum, uh, uh, beams carrying orbital angular momentum, while our group here was sort of hesitant to start using them, and I will mention why. But we broke down and we're using them now. Okay. So in any case, the other thing which I'll be showing you is that I can produce the beams, I can use normal beam here, uh, just linearly polarized beam, and then have little diffractive elements, microscopic diffractive elements to create beams which carry orbital angular momentum, and I'll mention that as well. So the, so the title of the game here, which I'll be trying to give you, is that there are many ways of creating beams with uh, angular momentum, and this is what we'll be doing. Either circularly polarized light or orbital angular momentum of certain kind. 
Okay. So here I'm going to show you this. So here is a particle which is trapped. This is two micrometers particle polystyrene <coughs> sphere. It's trapped in highly focused laser beam, 1064 beam, and we are moving the beam around, and we can see that the particle stays trapped. We can see that the other particles which are not trapped, uh, we can see the brown in motion, and we also can see that when, when the trapped particle is standing still, it also wiggles tiny, tiny little bit, and that was the brown in motion that, that uh, Hisham was measuring. Okay, but really, again, I want to go to the rotational stuff. So how can I do it? I can look at, so, so I have to find uh, materials which will enable me to transfer the momentum of, uh, angular momentum of light. So I can have asymmetric particles in laser beam, which I'll tell you about. I can have the special laser beams, which are the singular laser beams, or I can have multiple tracks, which I won't talk about. Okay, so here are the examples of nice looking things which rotate. So this is calcite crystal uh, produced in the house, and it rotates quite slowly, but it does rotate. So, so what we are doing here, we have circularly polarized light, and we trap the particle, and as it is trapped, it also starts rotating, because we have transfer of spin angular momentum. Then we have perfectly spherical particles, which I will tell you more about, and uh, we trap it, and it rotates rather fast, and the only way we are moving this particle around, but you can also see that now this particle will start moving around because this one is so round that it's difficult to see its rotation, and so only by looking at the liquid and rotating around it will see, mm -hmm. uh, recognize the rotation, and I will talk more about those. We can have elongated particles, which we put into uh, uh, linearly uh, polarized light, and we'll get rotation occurring there too, and we'll touch upon that. And then, although you cannot see it, I have gauss Laguerre beam of light here and a dumbbell created from two spherical particles, which are polystyrene particles, and they can rotate pretty fast in the uh, beam which carries all the angular momentum. So it's pretty cool. So what we want to talk about are all those sorts of rotation, but we also want to talk about these uh, little particles which we create in order to be able to transfer spin orbital, spin angular momentum. So what we do, we want we aim at, to, at twisting and turning as well as pushing and pulling, so optical spanner op and optical tweezers. We want to do it by known amount, so optical torque range, which I showed you in one of the previous transparencies. We want to use either spin or we want to use auto angular momentum. And again, I repeat, this is the stuff we will be trying to create. Okay, so we start first. So now, what I will do is I will concentrate on spin angular momentum in the first hour, and I will concentrate on orbital angular momentum in the second hour. Okay, so spin angular momentum. So we take circularly polarized light. It's either <coughs> right-handed or left-handed circularly polarized light. And uh, we want to see whether we can uh, uh, induce rotation. So this is not a new experiment. Uh, we just happen to do it on microscopic scale. But this is original BET experiment, which was done in 1936. So, uh, uh, so what he did is he passed circularly polarized light twice through a lambda, that should say lambda here, lambda over two plane, suspended by torsion on the torsion tension, uh, torsion fiber. And what he achieved was angular momentum was transferred, and that transfer was 4 h bar per photon. Uh, so this was the first measurement of the angular momentum transfer. So what we want to do, so here we have um, lambda over 4 plate, uh, and so we want to find material which will act as lambda over 4 plate, put circularly polarized light on it, uh, to, and put it through a uh, highly, uh, highly metal aperture objective, and see that we can repeat this experiment on microscale. So a few years later, that is, he did it in 1936, we did it a few years later. Uh, so we achieved a uh, uh, transfer of angular momentum of light. Okay, so I have plane polarized light. I put it through an either lambda over two or lambda over four plane. I have a high numerical aperture. And now I need to have lambda over four plane. So I have to have a material. You know that lambda over four plane is made out of a material which is bifringing. 
Okay, so this is a little bit, where is Ivan? Ivan was talking about um, in liquid crystals. Well, this is slightly, and he was talking about ordinary and extraordinary refractive index. So these are materials which have ordinary and extraordinary refractive index, which stays throughout the material, no matter what the polarization of the light is around it. And then if you put, if, if, the, if the material is uh, highly bifringent, of special thickness, which is lambda over 4, then if you put a linearly polarized light on it with optics axis 45 degrees to it, then you will get on the output of that plane circularly polarized light. Okay, so now I take this, uh, in this case, uh, calcite crystal is known to be very highly bifringent, so I take a shard of calcite crystal and I put it, put it under my optical tweezers. Okay. So what happens with this calcite crystal, crystal which is dispersed in water, uh, it will be three-dimensionally trapped. So that's one thing we wanted to do. And they either rotate continuously or align to a particular orientation. So if I, if I have linearly polarized light, so if I take lambda over two plate and put it in this position, then the orientation can be controlled. Why? Because I can change the axis of the lambda over two plate and the crystal will follow the or, or, orientation of the lambda over two plate. So if I put this lambda over two plate on a, on a motor of some sort, then I can get rotation going. If I have elliptically or circularly polarized light, the crystals will rotate and the frequency of the rotation will be controlled. Okay. So let us look at that. So here is a shard of calcite crystal. It's rather large and therefore it's not trapped three-dimensionally. And what we are doing is we are aligning it with the axis of lambda over two plate. So I'm turning lambda over two plate and my crystal is following the, the rotation of my lambda over two plate. So the optics axis of crystal aligns to electric field vector. Okay, and then again we have quite a large uh, crystal shard of crystal and we now put the lambda over four plate in, in this setup and I'm now transferring uh, spin angular momentum to the plate, oops, spin angular momentum to the plate, and it rotates nicely. It is sort of quite large, it's about 9 microns in size, therefore it's not particularly strongly trapped in Z direction, because in Z direction the trapping is always much weaker, so it sort of nudges the, 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 the microscope slide, so therefore it sort of jets back and forth in the beam. So it's not very nicely rotating. But when we change from left-handed to right-handed polarized light, the crystal changes the uh, direction of rotation. Okay, so how, how do we understand this phenomenon? So this is optical angular momentum is transferred to a wave plate when it alters the beam polarization. So I, th I take my elliptically polarized light. So here is my picture of what's happening. So this is optic axis of trapped calcite particle. This is five, uh, past axis of lambda over four plate. And this is the plane of polarization of light on the lambda over four plate. Okay, so I can write my electric field vector, and this is the expression for it. So now the light is passing through the material. Then the light uh, is phase shifted by KDN, where DN is the change in the... Uh, uh, the D is uh, the, the, the thickness of the, of the um, uh, bifringian crystal, and uh, the emerging field will be given by this expression here. Okay, so then for a plane wave, the total angular momentum of the field is given by this expression, so the angular momentum densities of the field before, L0, and after, L final, passing through the crystal are given by these two expressions. If you, so this is the original one, and then the thing is going through bifringent crystal. So this is the difference between ordinary and extraordinary refractive index, and these were the angles in my, in my figure before. And we can analyze this uh, expression here, and we can see that if we now look at the, uh, uh, the change in the angular momentum of light uh, which results in torque per unit area on this bifringent particle, this will be the torque on my particle. So I have two bits in this equation, and if we closely look at this equation, this will be the alignment term, which will 
So if I put my lambda over two plane and change the, the angle of the lambda over two plane, I'll be manipulating this thing. And if it, this second um, term in this equation gives me the rotation of the curve. Okay? So that means that I can quantify the torque that is uh, acting in this experiment. So one of ways of doing it, if you don't have Theo in your group, and you don't do clever things with micro machines, you can take shard of the crystal, get it rotating, pretend that you have a cock, put them together, and what I will do is I will try to uh, connect this, uh, this rotating, uh, the motor of the whole thing, to this um, cock, and because I'll be, I'm doing it in liquid, because the liquid will be moving around, this cock will uh, be going. Okay, so these are very, very old. Uh, frames that we've done many years ago. And so basically this is quite fast rotating shard of calcite, and then I have badly made cob, and it goes round and round because the liquid around this thing is moving. So the cob goes around. Then you can take two cogs, and the idea of this one was that we will try to bring the cogs together, match them together and have a connected machine, but we never succeeded with that. But what we instead were able to do is that we trap now this cog and we trap the crystal. The crystal rotates and the cog uh, uh, rotates around its axis. And then by sheer accident, we also have a connected machine. But as I said, sort of happened by accident. It's quite large shard of crystal, which is now trapped on axis with the cog. And so because the crystal is turning around, the machine under it is turning around. Not very efficient machines, however, we can use the liquid which is rotating to rotate our machines. Okay, but as I said, what we really want to do is to produce um, uh, materials which can rotate very fast. Um, so this is not one of them, because here we were able to produce calcite crystal, so it's calcium carbonate, comes in two forms, and this is the one of the forms. And it looks pretty though. Uh, you have to agree, but it's totally useless. Okay, so what we want to do is, as I said, find materials which will enable us very fast rotation. So, so there are two things we want to do. We have to produce something which is biofringent, highly biofringent. So calcium carbonate would be a good example of that because the biofringent step is quite substantial. Secondly, what we want to do is to have our materials to form spheres. Why spheres? Because if you got yourself a sphere, then uh, analyzing how much torque you are applying or what sort of rotation you have is very simple. Because mathematics behind it is very simple. So the aim of the game is to produce spherical uh, bifringent particles. And there are old, old recipes, and um, uh, we have sort of modified those recipes a little bit to be able to produce spherical calcium carbonate crystals. And I would wish to be able to say it's very easy. And I often say that, oh, it's easy. You just mix few chemicals together, a little bit of voodoo, as Norman, my colleague, says here, and then you've got yourself controllable sizes of the spherical particles. But I think that Cecile is sitting here, who has been trying to produce them for a little while, and sometimes they turn out to be very nice and round, and sometimes they don't work. And then there is some sort of problem with the recipe and we go back and we just uh, say voodoo again and maybe next time around Cecile will have spherical crystals. But anyway, you can see it works from time to time anyway. So here is our spherical calcium carbonate uh, and uh, this is the optical image. So it's diffraction limited a little bit, but we take the image in scanning electron microscope, uh, microscope and this is how the spherical calcium carbonate looks like. So what we want to, as I said, the aim of the game was that we wanted to have better probe particles, smooth rotation, and three-dimensional traffic. So three-dimensional traffic. So we can produce them, I say. I'm not doing that. Yep. How do you determine if they're spherical in a set image versus a 2D? Very good question. Um, hmm. So uh, uh, basically you can try to turn them around and look from different directions. Of course in SEM you cannot do it because it's fixed. 
But in optical microscope, you will actually see, if you turn them around, you will see that they're slightly oval, and that's the problem which Cecile has at the moment. That sometimes they turn out to be, you know, you turn them around a little bit and they are sort of a little bit oval instead of spherical. But a very good question. Okay, so this is calcium carbonate and spherical. And as I said, how do we know that it's calcium carbonate? Well, few of the upcoming slides will be a little bit of material science in it. Uh, simple way we can do it. So how do I know that it's... It, it, so this calcium carbonate comes in two crystal forms. Uh, and one of them is called vaterite. Okay, so how do I know that I'm dealing with vaterite? I can do XRD uh, analysis and I can see at the spectrum of it and, um, and I can recognize that it's a structure like vaterite should have. So that's all right. How can it be spherical then, you would ask? So your question wasn't how come that it can be spherical, but how do I know that it's spherical? But the other quite interesting question is that, in fact, it is spherical because it's not a single crystal, and a single crystal of this material obviously is not spherical. Okay? So this is, I think it has not an hexagonal structure. What's the structure? I can't remember. But anyway, it's not spherical, right? So the question is, oops, sorry? Hexagonal. Hexagonal structure. Okay, so now the question arises, how come that you can take single crystal, which is hexagonal structure, and then mix it in some sort of a solution, and overall get spherical crystal forming? The other question you could ask, even if that would be somehow possible, which I showed it could be, how come it's still biofringent? What biofringent means is that you have predominant optic axis along which you have your ordinary and extraordinary refractive index. So those indices have to be maintained in this micron-sized crystal, which is pretty surprising, isn't it? Okay. So how, do, so how come that, that those crystals which form and, and can be actually spherical can still be bifringy? So the idea is that they grow something like this, that they grow like sheets of wheat. So there are little crystals bump on each other, and then they sort of form like sheets of wheat. And then they sort of fill those little bits and pieces, and all of a sudden, bingo, you have spherical crystal. So that's how it happens. But how come that it's still so biofringent? Well, this is how they're formed. So they sort of stack on each other, and then eventually they sort of form this sheet of wheat, which has predominant, very well defined, optics axis. Okay, so this is how the sort of, uh, oh, well, <coughs> this is how the crystal looks like. I think my slides are a little bit of out of order. So let me just change gears so I can follow my slides. And it is that one thing is to be able to measure uh, the torque, and then the other thing is to have it to be applied to something. So if you want to apply this, uh, this crystals to, say, uh, biological applications, you have to put it in a buffer solution. So when you all of a sudden put them in the buffer solution, they melt. So they are not much use. So what you have to do, you have to put something around them so that you can close the crystal inside and put a shell around it which you can you can prevent the crystal from melting, and a shell has to be made of such a material that you can also functionalize it with biological proteins. So this is what we do here. We cover the crystal with APS primer, monolayer, and then with PIOS sealer layer, and then APS functionalization monolayer, and then we put proteins on it, for example, streptavidine, and then we come with biotin and see whether they will bite. If we are able to do all this, then it means that we can use those crystals for some useful stuff rather than just looking at how they will take, which we like a lot anyway. Okay, uh, so how do we know that this functionalization works? So I could absorb a fluorescent dye. I can do XPS and EDS to confirm that I have silicon dioxide coating on them. 
and I can do a scanning electron microscope to monitor the surface, stru surface structure, and so uh, and then put it into the buffer solution and see whether they melt. And in fact, when when they are properly functionalized with all those layers which I showed you, they actually survive many hours in the solution. So here is. Um, the uh, evidence of that, if I have uncoated vaterites uh, and, I, um, uh, and I look at them eventually in fluorescence microscope, of course they don't fluoresce because there's no fluorescence on, attached to them. If I put ABS coating on them, so this is, uh, this is the um, optical microscope and this is fluorescence microscope, you can see that they fluoresce quite strongly. And then if we put the second layer on them, again the same, same thing, uh, and the coating, you can see that they fluoresce quite uh, uh, substantially. Uh, and so this is the evidence that we can functionalize those things. Okay, so I don't know why those slides ended up there, but anyway, so back to my story about the materials. So um, how are they made? So this is the recipe, this is how simple it is. A little bit of solution, shake the stuff, and you got yourself spherical crystals. I don't think that, uh, um, uh, Cecil or Guillaume, if he's here, or Alex would agree with me, but for me it sounds very easy when I'm sitting in my room and they make spherical particles. Um, so this is quite nice here. So this is the spherical particle which we produced. This is from a scanning electron microscope. You can see the scale here and you can see the energy we use, but we also produce quite nice structures otherwise, but totally unusable for those ones. Okay, so we can see how biofringent the crystals are. So what we are doing here is that uh, we are looking at, we're putting the crystal, the, 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 the batterite crystal between cross polarizers and we're turning the crystal around, okay? And when you turn it around, you can see that uh, the transmitted light uh, is changing, okay? So here we also, no, I don't want to do that. Oh, sorry, I want to show you what happens. So here is the crystal, I trap it, I just rotate it and then eventually we'll trap it. So this is just being turned around and now we'll trap it. So these are all those patterns taken from there, and there is laser beam, and it aligns itself with optics axis, and you can see all those patterns here. Okay, so do we understand what's happening, or does it fit with the model that we predicted it should be? So this is the sheaf of wheat which we are modeling, and Timo here will be talking about the theory and modeling tomorrow and we'll tell you what this model is based upon, but basically we are now getting the um, electromagnetic field coming onto our biofringent particle. We are assuming that it's sheath of wheat, so that's just the picture that I was showing you a few slides before. And then we calculate, depending on the diameter of the particle, what sort of pattern we should have in our cross polarizers. If this model, uh, depending on the angle, it, if this model is correct. And you can see that those pictures look pretty similar to what I was showing you in previous transparency. And then if we vary the diameter of the particle, and Timo will tell you more about that, all that, then you see that the, 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 the pattern of uh, the crystal varies quite dramatically. So we understand what's happening. How am I going for time now? Uh, I have still a few minutes? Yeah, five minutes. Five minutes, okay. So I just start on microbiology. So what do we have? We have spin angular momentum being transferred to biofringent particle, and I want and I know that I can use it in biological environment because I can coat it. I know that it's biofringent. I didn't show you how biofringent it is, but I will do it in a minute or in the second hour. But now the question is, can I use it for something useful? So what we are going to describe here is firstly how we can measure rotation and torque, and then obviously if I can measure rotation and torque, that means that I've got myself microreometer, okay? So that means that I can take a look at the viscous, viscous 
properties of liquids on microscale. Okay, so that's what I'm after. So I take circuit power as light. I have my crystal, which is bathroom crystal or lambda over four plate. And I put the circuit polarized light, and the state of polarization of this light is changing. So if I, uh, and, and, and the light is carrying H bar per photon of spin angular spin angular momentum, either left handed or right handed polarized, circuit polarized. So if I try to maintain circular symmetry to avoid all to angular momentum, which we haven't mentioned yet, then if I only can measure the change, what I will try to show you now that. If I know how much power I have in my incoming beam, if I know the size of the particle and I can measure all the light which is transmitted through the particle uh, under the assumption that I collect all the transmitted light and I can measure state of polarization of the transmitted light, then I will be able to characterize the liquid around this lambda uh, uh, this of So in summary, Circularly polarized light, I will evaporate particle, I transfer spin angular momentum, the state of polarization is changing, so it's maybe elliptically polarized light now which is transmitted. I assume that I can collect all this light and measure the state of polarization. So the degree of polarization is I look at the left handed polarized light, the transmitted light, left handed, right handed uh, circularly polarized light divided by the incoming power of the beam, and that gives me degree of polarization of the light which is transmitted. How do I do it? I take the light, transmit it through uh, the particle, I put lambda over four plate, I have beam splitter, I have two detectors, and I look at left-handed, right-handed polarized components. So I can measure that in my detectors. Here or here, I have measured the power of the incoming light, so I can calculate the degree of polarization. Okay, now we also have angular momentum flux acting here, so I have this degree of polarization times power divided by omega, and then I also have optically applied torque, which is change in polarization times the power divided by optical frequency, and of course I have surrounding fluid, and so this will react to the rotation of the particle. So I have viscous drag torque, and the viscous drag torque goes like viscosity, 8 pi viscosity times x spheres, uh, radius to the third, times frequency of rotation. Okay, and these two should balance now. And if they do, then I can uh, determine, so what I'm doing is I'm comparing these two expressions now. Optically applied torque to viscous drag torque, they should be equal. So you can see that I can now calculate uh, the viscosity of the liquid. Under the assumption that the liquid is only viscous, not viscous. What do I have to have? I have to have means of measuring frequency of rotation, and I'll show you that. I have no now size of the my particle. This is under the assumption it's spherical and uh, measure the change in polarization, which I showed you how to do. So this is my viscosity. Very sensitive to the size of the particle because it goes like one over eight to the third. So if we don't know the particle uh, uh, diameter, radius, then we are in real trouble. But the rest of it can be measured quite easily. Practically, shall I stop now? Or? Okay, so we'll come to that after the break. to one of your videos where you have this on-axis rotation. Can you maybe see it again? Sure. I'm not sure I have a question, but I might have when I see it again. Okay, not a problem. <laughs> Okay, how does 
lambda over 4 plane works. Okay, so what you have, you have um, bifringent material, which means you have piece of material which has two refractive indices, ordinary, extraordinary refractive index. Imagine now, and it's set in thickness of the plane. Okay? So imagine now that the linearly polarized light comes to this and has its axis 45 degrees to the direction of ordinary refractive index and extraordinary refractive index. So that gives me amplitude of the extraordinary wave and ordinary wave to be equal. Then I propagate that wave through the material. So that's the thickness of the material, which gives me phase shift. If that phase shift is equal to pi of 2, I've got myself separately polarized line on the, out, on the outer of the material. So it critically depends upon the angle of incidence of the linearly polarized line and the thickness of the material. So this is why it's called lambda of a four plane, because you can show that in order to get circularly polarized light, when your electric field vector goes like a circle, you need the plate to be lambda over 4 in thickness to get that phase shift. Yes? Uh, how can we control the speed of rotation of the stuff? How can we control the speed of rotation is the question? Yeah. Wait till after break.